Um, hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm quite excited to be here. And first, I'd like just to thank the organizers for putting together such a great conference. Uh, thanks so much for the invite. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I'm a philosopher. OK, so bear with me. I don't have a lot of uh, formal stuff that you like. Um, this is also brand new research. So I'm testing the waters here and see if there's something that I should carry on doing or not. So let me know. All the feedback uh, is very welcome. Um, OK, so having said that, let me start by just um, just saying that what I want, what I want to research here is uh, the impact of action, and I take uh, subjective experience to be in the action. Okay, so the idea here is to look at how action is what may or may not allow um, explaining the neural connectivity in the brain. Okay, so the presentation will be divided in two parts, uh, one metaphysical, the other one is neuroanatomy. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the fundamental distinction uh, between um, the metaphysics of inference, between functional and uh, effective connectivity. This will then allow me to focus on effective connectivity. And I want to look at uh, particularly on the ocular motor system as sort of a study case. Uh, and I'm going to look at that from the active inference point of view. OK, so um, yeah, we all know uh, from the last three days at least that the integration of the brain areas is something that is quite difficult to assess. And one way to do that is by looking to um, the, in terms of the brain connectivity and how cognition uh, integrates from that point of view. Which is what motivates me to look at the metaphysics of uh, the connectivity. So first, um, I want to just focus on uh, the motivation. Okay. So the idea here is that um, there is this oper operational distinction uh, between functional and effective uh, connectivity, and this is important because it uh, allows us to determine the nature of the inferences that can be made about cognitive integration, and also, most importantly, the questions that one should be asking. Um, and I'm following here uh, Friston uh, in doing so. So what I want to do is just look at uh, um, the differentiation on the one hand on the causal modeling in effective connectivity and on the other hand uh, as it is opposed to the procedures used to characterize um, functional connectivity. OK, so let me start by looking at functional connectivity. Um, just the very basics. Um, the aim uh, is that it is inferred on the basis of temporal correlations between time series of different brain regions uh, in a sort of measurements of uh, this modular neural um, activity. These connections uh, can then be understood in terms of this causal asymmetry, that is, in terms of these probabilities and temporal order. OK, so um, the aim here, um, and what is more important, is that uh, the aim is uh, that, uh, to identify which are the segregated brain regions that are most likely uh, to connect in order to carry on a specialized kind of function or for a task domain. And uh, I think Han and colleagues uh, capture this really well when they say that the functional specialization and anatomical segregation of neural networks in the brain imply that it is organized as a distributed hierarchical network of highly specialized networks of spiking neurons. So the idea is that there's this time-resolved functional connectivity, uh, which is claimed as crucial to displaying a sort of a balance between, on the one hand, functional segregation, and on the other hand, integration of brain networks. And here is where uh, modularity networks comes uh, uh, handy and particularly important, because it attempts to do just that, to find the patterns of correlations between functionally segregated areas uh, on the one hand and its significant uh, integration on the other hand and that's where it becomes uh, quite important. On the other hand we have um, effective connectivity and here we look at the causal dependencies more like uh, sort of uh, what motivates uh, the coupling or the direct influence uh, between uh, for example A and B. Um, this will rest obviously explicitly on a model of that influence uh, that is called a generative model. 
this kind of models, the generative models, are then compared um, as the probabilistic strategy uh, is at the heart of this analysis in effective connectivity. So uh, following Friston, it tells us that effective connectivity explains brain's networks by virtue of accounting for the dynamic activity, activity dependent and the dependence on a model of these uh, interactions. Um, one example of uh, these uh, studies on effective connectivity can be found, for example, uh, in uh, Sokolov um, and colleagues uh, when they look at visual sensitivity to biological motion. Uh, that cause changes in the connectivity and actually how this active uh, interaction relates to behavior. So this analysis of effective connectivity, it, ca ca it can be said that it is both neural and activity led. And it is on this account that these models uh, conducted or uh, carried by effective connectivity are said to be quite dynamic. So the idea is that is they do not suppose that there, are, there is this invariant structure that can be captured anatomically. Okay, so um, just let, it, let us just have a look at how we can just uh, uh, systematize these differences between functional and effective connectivity, which will allow us, that, allow us, allows me to then move forward to effective connectivity. Okay, on the one hand, we have uh, effect, the, fu the functional connectivity as being a sort of uh, identifying temporal correlations or covariances, and on the other hand, effective connectivity as a matter of explaining uh, these causal dependencies. We have uh, also on functional connectivity uh, the aim to map from um, imaging data, which is uh, its physiological consequences to its diagnostic uh, class, uh, which is a categorical kind of cause. On the other hand, we have on effective connectivity a sort of a model comparison, as we just saw, generative models of coupling among these hidden brain states. Um, Sorry, uh, on the other hand, in effective connectivity, we have mapping from causes to consequences, so the other way around. So we have on functional connectivity a sort of a predictive model, whereas on effective connectivity, uh, it's more of a model comparison, a generative model of coupling among hidden brain states. Okay, good. So some people think uh, and come forward to say that, well, effective connectivity is more powerful and less ambiguous. Okay, and this would um, this would be the idea also um, uh, followed by Friston in 2011. Well, it when it tells us well this is the case because it captures both the topological pairwise connections as well as direct causal influences, and we can see that uh, in these graphs in which uh, on the first uh, one the structural causal modeling um, we can uh, look at the topological pairwise connections, and on the second one with the, the dynamic causal model modeling we can see that, but we can also see the direct causal influence. So this is what motivates me to now focus on the effective connectivity and how we can explain that uh, by looking at the ocular motor system. Okay, so um, what makes the ocular motor system such an interesting case is that it is a distributed network uh, com composed by the cerebral cortex, basal ganglia and the cerebellum. And the idea here is that there are neural messages uh, from these regions that combine uh, to generate signals to the extraocular mus muscles to move the eyes. So to show this kind of coupling between perception or vision and action, um, I will, and the causal dependencies on this neural connection, I will first look at the neuroanatomy and then I'm going to look at the active inference. Okay, so just a very basics, um, I just want to uh, flesh out just the, the saccadic eye. Uh, so we have the dynamic integration of vision and action, why? Well, because um, the action takes the form of the saccadic eye movements, that is a series of these discrete fixations um, that are interposed by uh, rapid, rapid movements. So. While we may select a new target for fixation, it is necessary to apply forces that accelerate the eyes towards their targets. So this is the very basics of it. Now, moving at how we could explain um, this relation between perception and action through active inference, we can say that, well, by forming hypotheses, um, these saccades can be uh, deployed as experiments to adjudicate among alternatives. 
So unpacking this a little bit, objects in the visual field become hypotheses or explanations that take the form of something like what uh, would I see if I uh, looked there. So um, Bayesian filtering equations can be used and implemented to planning uh, as, uh, as inference, which can generate both saccadic and smooth pursuit eye movements. So importantly, the associated message passing will map pretty well onto the known connectivity in neuroanatomy of the brain stem, which I obviously didn't and don't have time to explain here. Okay, so this is um, the main point is just that there are these signals that are carried by each eye to the brain stem and they can be classified into broad categories. And this is what, uh, what the main point that I want to stress out here. That's the exteroceptive and the proprioceptive. So on the exteroceptive, as we all know, we have the visual signals to the optic nerve. And then on the proprioceptive level, um, there is this uh, extra ocular muscles into the ocular motor nerves, uh, which control the angular, mo and angular position and velocity of each eye. Okay, so in other terms, Visual signals are then generated through an identity mapping from the position of the eyes, right? So this means that what the eye sees, um, what the eye see depends entirely on where they look. This becomes quite important because uh, then proprioceptive states are what uh, comes to ensure that this mapping from the hidden states uh, to to outcomes. And the result of these outcomes is that then hysteroception, so vision, is depending on in a is dependent in a probabilistic sense on proprioception, which is to say uh, in action. So the idea is that vision is dependent on action, and action will be what explains these visual connections. Okay, um, this causality between action and perception can be explained uh, in terms of the free energy principle, uh, which is uh, that living systems must, must minimize the variational free energy over time. And this minimization of the free uh, energy through action and perception is referred to as uh, active inference. Active inference, um, and very briefly, is just this theory that is derived from the principle that living systems must minimize uh, the dispersion of their, their states in order to continue to exist in a sort of a meaningful way. And in order to do that, to find the things that are relevant to their own existence so that they don't die, um, they draw these predictions about the sensations that they will encounter and actively sample them, in them to reduce this uncertainty um, or mathematically uh, the expected Bayesian surprise. Okay, um, now. This becomes a form of uh, what um, Thomas Parr and Cole Friston called the uh, active vision. And this is the bit that I'm very interested on, uh, on um, working on and building from. Um, so this is the idea that this active vision is a generative process. Uh, these field circles uh, are what gives rise to the sensory data. And then we have, on the other hand, the generative model, which is the unfilled circles, uh, which proposes this data uh, is generated. Now, an arrow connecting two variables indicates that the second variable is conditionally dependent on the first. And this is what I'm particularly interested in because this, this means that eyes are conditionally dependent on target fixation prediction. Okay, so these fictive uh, locations then will cause changes in position in the generative model. And which brings us to conclude that then action is part of this generative process. Okay, so um, then how do we um, put all of this together? Well, uh, these equations can be implemented by passing messages between populations of neurons, ascending messages here are excitatory prediction errors, while descending messages are the inhibitory uh, predictions. And it is these patterns that characterizes what we know as a predictive coding. Now we see on the right hand, on the left hand side, we got equations that describe this kind of uh, gradient descent on variational free energy um, 
neural message passing and on the, on the right side we have these equations mapping to the scheme of this generative model. So what happens is that we have a map of the influences between each population with excitatory and inhibitory connections. Okay, good. Now, uh, bringing this to an end and take a message, what I want to say and what I want to uh, research uh, on um, building on this is that, well, first, uh, I think there are a few quite uh, relevant and important points to take from here is that exteroceptive vision and proprioception emerge from a single imperative which is to contextualize each other in the sense that they all uh, are reducing, uh, minimizing the free energy. In effective connect connectivity terms, uh, then what motivates the specific establishment of certain synaptic connections in visions is the active exploration, and this is the bit that I'm quite interested of the world, by focusing on what appear as salient to a member of a certain phenotype. Now, in other terms, this means that active inference, um, um, active domain, the active dimension of vision is what explains these visual connections. So, which means that we're not just simply uh, collecting uh, or picking out uh, what we see uh, in the world. There is an active dimension to it. Now, finally, the effect of connectivity captures this essential, what is essential to the construction and explanation of the hierarchical process in the visual world. Okay, now coming to the last slide as to future work, um, I just want to say that it would be quite important and crucial, I think, to find um, these um, links between network topology and neural dynamics that can address the empirical problem of how the brain adapts in a dynamic and flexible way and according to the demands of the cognitive interaction with the environment, which I take to be the subjective experience. Now, this was not a talk about subjective experience. Um, this doesn't mean that I don't think that there is such thing as subjective experience. I think there is it's in action. And by the way, I wrote a paper on what it feels like to prove a mathematical equation. So, but Actually, this talk was more about the role that subjective experience plays in neural connections or, or, and, and also neural deployment. So the question uh, that I think is quite relevant to, uh, to uh, work on future research is how this subjective experience acts on the ways that the brain connects and reorganizes um, to connect um, in cognitive terms. So, this is me. Thank you very much for your attention.